Let's get our Bibles out today. As we are studying through the book of Philippians, we're still in chapter 1, starting in verse 15. Wow, that's loud. That's like the book of Exodus right there. Amen. Philippians chapter 1, verse 15. I'm going to start reading all the way through verse 20. The Apostle Paul writing the gospel, well, the epistle of joy to the Philippians while he's in chains, while he's under house arrest. Somehow he's lost his liberty, but he's maintained his joy, and it's spilling over through him, giving us an example that we can have joy in any situation in life. Anybody under house arrest? Anybody in chains this morning? Even though we live in New Yorkistan, we still have some liberties. Get ready, get ready, get ready. We're going to get a chance to vote here soon. Amen. I, I, ho I hope we've had enough. But Paul has lost his liberty. He's chained up, yet he has joy, and that speaks to us. We start off in verse 15 here of chapter 1. Father, thank you for the word today. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for moving in this place. Thank you for all that you have in store for us. We pray that the word would come alive to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul says, so to be sure, he says, to be sure some are preaching Christ even for envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking that they are causing me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. But not only that, I also will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Though your prayers, through your prayers and provisions of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my eager expectation and hope, that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that will with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. So some powerful things Paul's communicating here to the Philippians, sharing his heart, allowing his attitude to show. And he starts off here in verse 15, some, to be sure, are preaching Christ from envy and strife and some from goodwill. What we see here is Paul just exposing the fact that people have different motives for doing spiritual things. Now, you might say, well, who cares what the motive is? You know, just, you know, let's do spiritual things. Well, motives are very important. Motives determine whether or not what you do uh, can be a blessing to you and to others. Motives determine whether or not God can bless and affirm and, and, and put his uh, affirmation on the way with it. Wrong motives bring wrong results. Doing spiritual things with the wrong motive is foolish because there's no reward. Well, I come to church because, you know, it's my obligation. Then you're here for the wrong reason. Well, I give because, you know, I have to. Well, then you, you have the wrong motive, amen. I've heard people say before, God loves a cheerful giver, but he'll take from an old grouch anyway. And I, I just don't agree with that. You know what? If you, if you don't want to give, if you're upset about it, if you feel like, you know, God's somehow ripping you off by asking you to sow into the kingdom, please keep it in your pocket. Don't bring it. We don't need it. I know you're probably not going to hear that at a lot of churches. But, you know, motives matter. I would rather have a few people good, give with good hearts, amen, and so into the ministry. I believe God could do more with that, with people who just want to see the kingdom of God advance, than a whole bunch of people grudgingly giving and, oh, you know, I'm a big giver. Well, God bless you. Wrong motives bring wrong results. In verse 15, Paul breaks down the two groups of people within the Philippian church preaching the gospel and he breaks them down into two camps, the envy and strife camp and the goodwill camp. Now, you don't, you don't need a PhD in anything to know which camp you want to be in. Okay, envy and strife, no, not good, not good motives, not good results. Goodwill, the right camp. So let's look at these two here and kind of unpack what Paul's implying here. 
Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ. Now, it's Christ, and it's the gospel, but here are the motives, from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. Uh, Though it's listed second, I want to look at the goodwill camp first. The goodwill camp are those preaching the gospel in the spirit of love and humility. You know, the gospel is the good news. That's what the word gospel means. The good news is that God made a way for us sinners to be saved from our sin because Jesus died in our place, amen? There are no perfect people at Full Gospel Center this morning. There are no perfect pastors at Full Gospel Center this morning. We are all sinners saved by grace. We've been transformed by the blood of Jesus. Come on, someone say amen. And so the goodwill camp preached the gospel, the good news, out of a spirit of Love and humility. Now, who did they love? They loved, number one, Jesus. Of all the things we've got to love to have the right attitude and to have the right motives, we've got to love Jesus. Anything we do in the kingdom, anything we do that's spiritual, any good works that we do that is not born out of and driven and motivated by a love for Jesus is a waste of time. It's a a spiritual religious exercise that produces no eternal fruits. We've got to love Jesus. And so who did they love? The goodwill camp. Well, they loved Jesus with all their hearts. They loved the lost. They loved people that didn't yet know the gospel. You know, people that are on the outside looking in of the kingdom of God, who are lost in their sins, who struggle with the weight of life on their shoulders every day. You and I need to have a love and a brokenness and a passion for those people. Pastor Mike, we can't just come into the church and treat it like a God bless me club. Oh, God bless me and my family. God bless us four and no more. No, we've got to be thinking about those outside. Tony, do you know if God never did anything more for me in my life, he's done more than enough. I'm good. I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. If he never answered one more prayer. But listen, there are a whole bunch of people on the outside that need Jesus. And to preach the gospel with the right attitude, to be in the goodwill camp, you've got to not only love Jesus, but you've got to love the lost. You've got to love the saints. We need to love each other. Do this here. I know this is going to hurt some of you, but turn to your neighbor on the right and your left and say, I love you in Jesus' name. No grimacing. Wow, this is good. I love you. That's your, that's your, your imaginary friend, Pastor Mike. Go ahead. He loves that wall in Jesus' name. So we love the lost, we love each other, and these people also love the Apostle Paul. And they prove that, that while this guy's chained up and he's being carted around and he's lost his liberty, they're sending people to help him. They're sending the things he needs to pen his letters and write his epistles and do his ministry. They're actually sending bodies, people down there to be alongside of him. That's love, right? Amen. Thank God for the people who roll up their sleeves when we're in trouble and jump in the ditch with us. Amen. Those are our real friends. Not all. It looks like you're struggling. I'll pray for you. Don't get any of that on me. Come on. Man, I don't know about that. A couple, a handful of good friends in a time of affliction. So these guys were doing what they did out of love, and that was the right attitude. He says, he says this about them and their motives. He He knows their support. He knows their love. He says, knowing I was appointed for the defense of the gospel. Look at that. He he, he says, you guys understand my call is a divine call, that I'm doing God's will, and you coming alongside of me while I'm suffering here is the greatest display of love this morning. So Paul's giving his affirmation to the, the goodwill camp. They have the right motivation. Now let's look at the strife and envy camp. Some preach, uh, you know, out of envy and strife, some people out of goodwill. This group had several motives, and none of them were of love. You can say, well, love's not my motive, but this is. Listen, there's no substitute for love. Without love, you know, we're, we're sounding gong, we're tinkling this, we're it just, it, it, it's just a religious display. Verse 17 tells us exactly what their primary motivation was. Now, now brace yourself for this. For the former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition. Say ambition. Say selfish. You put those two words together and you got a mess. When someone's ambitious and they're self-centered and they're selfish, that's a person driven to elevate everything but God. 
to proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking that they are causing me distress in my imprisonment. Well, there's a lot in there. We're going to take a look at that here. These guys had wrong motives, and quite simply, Paul spells it out. Their motives are selfish ambition, and they actually have an intent to hurt Paul while he's in bondage. They really want to get Paul out of the way so they could uh, take his place in the ministry. We're going to look at that. But, you know, when he says here, like, you know, that thinking you are causing me distress, you're behaving the way you are out of selfish ambition because you think it's hurting me, causing me distress in my imprisonment. Wow. Life is tough enough when, you know, things are going wrong for us and there's injustice and we've got all kinds of burdens. But when we literally have people trying to make it worse for us and take advantage of us in our situation... That, that's as ugly as it gets right there. And, you know, we almost expect that from the world. You know, at your job, at your work, you know, you're hurt, you get moved, something happens, people are trying to take your spot. How many have experienced that in the world? People just, you know, trying to take your position, take your spot, push you out, go to the boss behind your back, say things that aren't true. Come on. That's the world, right? But that should not be in the body of Christ. And Paul's calling it out here. He's saying your selfish ambition with the intent to hurt me is, you know, that's your motivation, and it's just not right. Selfish ambition is something that, you know, uh, has no place in the body of Christ. They were using the gospel uh, to make a name for themselves, and people still do this. Some people see the gospel as an opportunity to, to rise to power, to prominence, to, you know, kind of give themselves a voice. Use it to, as a springboard into political aspirations. That's the wrong attitude. That's the wrong motivation for the gospel, amen? The gospel is not a career choice that you pick to enrich yourself with. You guys are way too quiet on Sunday morning here. But, you know, some of us have grown up through some of this stuff in the church, and we're a little bit more passionate about it because we've seen the destruction of it. Of people who would hijack ministry positions to, you know, make themselves notable or enrich themselves. And it's a stench in the nostril of God. And call, uh, Paul calls it out here. You know, these people saw what Paul was going through there as an opportunity, uh, you know, to advance themselves, to get him out of the way, to take Paul's position of apostolic leadership in the church they saw Paul's imprisonment as an opportunity. Well, how would that feel this morning if you're hurting, if you're down, if you're falling apart emotionally, financially, physically, and people are drooling over your spot to try and kind of take what you've got? Put yourself in that spot for a minute. And then keep that in mind because we're going to see Paul's response to it and Paul's attitude. He calls it out. Their motives are carnal, they're egotistical, they're petty, and they're ugly. Now, I want to say something about this sort of thing happening in the church. We should avoid division and politics in the church like a plague. We should avoid division and politics. Now, when I say politics, I said politics in the church. That doesn't mean we don't call out the issues of the day in the political realm and say, the Bible says we should stand for this. Listen, if we don't need to be voting for any more abortion. We don't need to be voting for any more drag queens in our schools. We don't need to be voting for sexual immorality. If, you, look, if the body of Christ can't vote for the things that are in Scripture, then we will never see the culture turn around. Now, I'm not talking about politics like that. I'm talking about politics in the church. Now, maybe you've never been to a church where, you know, there's wranglings of groups within the church trying to get into the board positions, positions of leadership, the, the pastorate, this, uh, but that stuff happens in the body of Christ. And, you know, maybe some of you have never experienced that, but those of us who've been around the block have seen it. That should not be. The, the church is not political in the sense where, you know, well, this is my group, and I want this position of power, and I want to control the board, and I want to control the pulpit. That's all nonsense. This is God's church, amen. God puts people in leadership positions here, and God removes them from leadership positions, amen. That's God's job. 
division in the church. This is ugly. Paul's in chains, and these guys are drooling over it. You're like, woo, that's a big vacuum. I want to take his place. I want to take his spot. People who think they can seize leadership positions in the body of Christ are categorically unworthy to be leaders in the body of Christ. In the world, if you study the kingdoms of the world, if you study successions of kings throughout, you know, Europe and all these things, do you realize what kings did to sit on thrones? They literally killed one another, and they would literally kill children who could be heirs so they could wipe out a lineage and take a throne and take a, seize a kingdom for themselves. It happened all throughout history. It happened in Israel's history. That's why God didn't want them to have a king. Listen, that's the world system. The church doesn't run like that. God is in charge of who leads and who serves and who gets what gift and who ministers, amen? So we're seeing something in the early church here that's very ugly, and Paul calls them out. Now, listen to Psalm 75, 6 through 7, for those who think they can seize ministry positions. For promotion comes neither from the east nor the west nor from the south, but God is the judge. He puts one down and he sets up another. Did you hear that? He puts one down and he sets up another. God installs leadership. We don't ever seize leadership. So what these guys are trying to do is categorically wrong. It's a wrong motive. Now, I want to say something after I said all that about seizing leadership. Sadly, through shrewdness and manipulation, people do get themselves in positions of leadership and even in the church. Through shrewdness and manipulation, uh, lying and being, you know, slippery. Come on, some of us who have been around have seen these things. Amen. And did you ever look at someone in a leadership position, maybe in the world, maybe at your job, and think, how in the world? <laughs> right, Scotty, how did, they, how did this guy get in charge? I used to work on a night crew at Pepsi, and the guy they put in charge, I mean, with his shoes and socks off, couldn't count to 11. <laughs> messing everything up, messing, and he was all in charge, and so, and we don't know, how did this guy, he ruined the night crew. But through shrewdness and manipulation and, you know, you've seen them before. Oh, they did grease this one and they compliment that one. And, they, and they're always, you know, when the boss comes through, they're working really hard and then they're back to sleep. And so people get in these positions and it happens even in the church. But I want to say this. Those people who try to seize leadership positions in the body of Christ will always fall and fail, they'll fail, and they will falter. Why? Because without a genuine call, you will never have a genuine anointing. And without a genuine anointing, you will never survive this world, your own flesh, or the devil. You can't do anything spiritual within your own strength. You have to be called. And when you're called, God will give you an anointing. But without an anointing, you won't survive the, the plan of the enemy. You won't survive your own flesh, your own ego. Come on, we've seen this stuff before. Ego-driven ministries, ego-driven churches uh, that, that just become devoid of the move of the Holy Spirit. They, they basically become, you know, these, these clubs that have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. A genuine calling produces a genuine anointing. You can't survive your own flesh. You can't survive the, the plan of the devil. Listen, when we were in Bible school, our teachers, I remember one day a professor stood up in front of the class, all pastors. You know, we were being trained to preach and do the work of the ministry. He said, if you can do anything else besides pastoring, you should do it. And if you can't, you're called. Did you get that? Because if you could do anything else and be blessed and have God's hand on your life and feel the peace of God, then you should do it. But if you can't, then you're called to the ministry and you can't do anything else. But if you're not called, you're never going to make it in the ministry. They told us flat out. You know, the Bible school we went to was like the Navy Seal of Bible schools, amen. You, people didn't survive the first two weeks there without being called. They were gone. Because the pressure and the intensity and the breaking and stripping process that took place up there to produce the anointing was intense. So 
People who think they can seize leadership, God causes kings to rise and fall. He puts one down and he elevates another. He puts Saul down and he elevated David. David was his choice. Saul was the people's choice. We need to learn from the Old Testament, amen? Now, the problem is with those who do seize leadership, they do eventually fall because it's unsustainable. But sometimes that's a a long process, and it's really painful to watch what these self-appointed, self-anointed, basically wolves do to the sheep. Why? Because they always leave behind a wake of brokenness, of hurt, and destruction. I've seen so many times people who claw their way into a ministry spot and they're not called and they're not anointed. They always hurt and wound the body of Christ. They always hurt the sheep. They draw the naive and the immature to themselves. They destroy baby Christians and children. I've seen families sucked in by these people who are, you know, going to start a church or do this stuff, and then they get sucked in and it gets spit back out and the kids never want to go to church again. And they plunge into the world and sometimes never come out. God help us. Paul has a great attitude here, but he's calling out those with wrong motives. Now, it's no accident that none of these people are named in Scripture. If you try and study who these people are or what their names were or what they went on to do, you'll find nothing. Why? Because the Bible refuses to give them their 15 minutes of fame. And we should learn something from that. Our American culture should learn something from that. I saw a T-shirt the other day that said, Stop making stupid people famous. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) It's just amazing. Who gets to, I mean, we make them famous. What do they do? We don't know. Are they funny? Not really. Are they talented? Can't tell. They're famous. See, the Bible doesn't do that. We should learn something from that. We should ignore these silly things in the world, these distractions, and just focus on Jesus. Verse 18 through 20 goes on to conclude the the thoughts of the text here, but again, Paul identifies the two groups, and then he, he displays this incredibly mature attitude about those preaching the gospel, and it's almost a little surprising given the fact that he uncovers their motives. Uh, you know, Paul has an incredible attitude because we're going to see there's a pattern in his life. He takes the high road in things, and he does it at the expense of his own ego. Now, if you're proud, you can't do that. If your ego's big, then you can't take the high road. You've got to have something to say. How many people have a big mouth and are immature? No, don't raise your hand. No, I always got to say something. I always got to give him my two cents. I always got him a piece of my mind. Listen, I'm 53 years old. There's not a lot of pieces of my mind left. I'm holding on to everything I got. And a lot of times I walk away and don't say anything. But here's, you know, Paul having just an incredible, mature attitude. Now, what kind of attitudes do we have? We're looking at Paul's here. We're going to unpack that in a second. But Being introspective, what kind of attitude do I have? How would people describe my attitude? Would they say I was like Paul, surprisingly gracious and mature? There have been times throughout, you know, almost 30 years of ministry here at Full Gospel Center where I handled a situation, and my wife said, well, that was really gracious of you. And to me, that's the greatest compliment, that my wife, who knows everything about me, would say, wow, you were really gracious in that. She's like, I would have murdered them and hid the bodies, and no one would have... But that's the greatest compliment is when someone looks at you and goes, well, we know you, and you you didn't kill anybody. You were were nice, you know? We got spots out in the Meadowlands, right? A couple couple plots. So, you know, what kind of attitude do we have? What would people say about us? How would they describe us? Would they say we're like Paul, we're gracious and mature? Or would they say we're we're cocky or we're thin-skinned? You know, a lot of people are thin-skinned. They can't let anything go. And, you know, when you're being prepared for ministry, that's the first thing to go is your skin, and then the next thing is your feelings. Because all of us as Christians have to be, you know, we have to be a little more thick-skinned. Well, they insulted me. They slighted me. I was joking with first service. I said, that pastor didn't shake my hand today. I'm leaving the church. I'm like, I didn't see your hand. Did you stick it out to me? Did, Did I go like this? Did I... I didn't see you. 
you know, I don't do, I don't do that. I'm like, oh, yeah, your hand. Uh. But people get all kinds of offended. I had one guy come, you were preaching right to me today. You knew what was going on. You were, you were trying to embarrass me. I'm like, I don't even know your name. How do I know? What? I'm just preaching with the Holy Spirit put here. I don't know what you're going through. I didn't wiretap your phone. I don't turn the camera on your computer on remotely and listening to you. That's the government's job. I'm not doing that. So understand, we, we got we to gotta be like Paul. We got to have a mature attitude. We got to take the high road. Say the high road. That's the road we should travel, amen. And Paul does that here. Or, you know, some of us are cocky or we're entitled or we don't let anything go. And we need the Holy Spirit to work that out of us. When we're mistreated, we can't act like babies. We can't demand an apology. We can't, you know, I hear people, well, I have a high expectations of people. I'm like, well, who are you? Captain Perfect, you never make a mistake. You're never wrong. I have high expectations. Well, that's nice. People are flawed. People are sinners. and All of us mess up. It's just amazing how our egos get so out of control. Paul was a humble guy. It all boiled down to this for him. If Christ was being preached and the message was theologically accurate, Paul was thrilled. He didn't care about who was preaching it, who was getting the credit for it, or what their motives were. He's like, if you're preaching the gospel and it's, it's not a false gospel, then I'm thrilled. Why did Paul have that attitude? Because he knew three things about the gospel, that it would produce fruit. And here's the first thing Paul knew about the gospel, that it had a power all its own. Listen to Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. Paul penned those words in Romans, and he knew the gospel had power. It didn't matter the conduit that it was coming out of. You know, it's like, well, God's up in heaven going, I got this gospel, and it's real powerful, but I need some perfect people to deliver it through, otherwise it's not going to work. That's not the truth at all. It comes through, I mean, God can speak through rocks. God in the Old Testament spoke through a, a, a donkey, amen? I, I figure if he could do that, he's got half a chance with me. You know, God can speak through anybody who's a willing vessel. <laughs> and so the, the gospel has a power all of its own, regardless of the motives or even the character of the person preaching it. Number two, he knew that the gospel was not man's idea, but it was God-breathed. Listen to Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. God is speaking. The word that comes from God's mouth. Listen, it shall not return to me void. That word void in the Hebrew means empty or without fruit. But it shall accomplish what I please. Wow. God says every time I speak, my words accomplish what I please. They are not void. They are not fruitless. They are not empty. But listen, the gospel is God-breathed. Man didn't make up the gospel of Jesus Christ. If this is a man-made gospel, i quit. And if I had a mic, I'd drop it and I'd leave. Because if I'm preaching man-made stuff, I'm wasting my time and your time. The gospel is God-breathed. It is God's idea. It returns to God with the fruit that he desired it to, to have. And Paul knew that. So it doesn't matter what these guys' motive is. It doesn't even matter if they want to hurt me. If they're preaching the true gospel, it will produce fruit. The last reason Paul uh, was able to just have the attitude that he had was not only did he know the gospel had a power of its own and it was God-breathed, but he's always seen God use imperfect people to get perfect results. There is no time in Scripture where God used a perfect person other than Jesus Christ. You know what? Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Samson, David, all the prophets, Peter, James, John, and Paul all have in common, they were sinners saved by grace. And God used each and every one of them to do his perfect will through imperfect people and get perfect results. Amen? <laughs> Praise God. God's not looking for perfect people. 
He's looking for people who know they're broken and they're humble enough to say, God, use me and don't leave me the way I am, but change me by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Conform me by the Holy Spirit to the image of Christ so that I can be a, a clear conduit and a vessel for your word to flow through. Amen. So Paul was like, I don't care if they got wrong motives. I don't care if they have bad attitudes. I don't even care if they're trying to tear me down so they can put, put themselves up. If they're preaching the gospel, I'm thrilled. I rejoice. Now, at this point, we should be seeing a pattern in Paul's life. And the pattern is this, that Paul always seems to be able to put the furtherance of the gospel above his ego. Isn't that beautiful? That's where we need to get in our place of maturity as Christians. That it's the things of the kingdom above our own agendas. It's the things of God above our own pride, above our own ego. That we can be humble enough to say, God, use me. And God, when you do, take all the glory for it. Amen? A lot of us need an ego check, you know, because if we're worried about getting the credit and the accolades and the notoriety, uh, then, you know, we're never going to get anything done in the kingdom of God. Some people won't lift a finger to do anything if what they're asked to do is not visible. I'm talking about church people. Right, Kelly? When we do a production, there's a lot of behind the scenes that nobody sees. In ministry, there's a lot of behind the scenes that nobody sees. If you think, well, oh, he gets to get up there and, you know, talk and everybody listens, it looks really fun. There's a lot of behind the scenes to get what's going on here to, you know, be halfway passable. <laughs> and so uh, understand some things here. If we have to be visible and if we have to get the credit, uh, we're not going to get much done in the kingdom. President Harry Truman said something to this effect. He said, imagine what we could accomplish if nobody cared who gets the credit. Imagine what we could accomplish, church, Imagine what we could accomplish, Full Gospel Center, if nobody cares who gets the credit and that all the glory goes to God. Amen? Come on. So whatever God calls you to do, if nobody sees it, you know, if you're cleaning out rooms, if you're scrubbing out toilets, if you're dragging out garbage, all that stuff goes on at the church. And we've all done it. I remember this one fella, he, ha he worked at a church where he, they, they demanded he wear a suit and tie to church every day, and they got him on his hands and knees scrubbing toilets in a suit and tie. And he did it, and he did it with joy. And God continued to promote him and bless him. So imagine what we could get done if nobody cares who gets the credit. Now, people in life can do things to us that hurt and devastate us. And I want you to put yourself in Paul's shoes here for a moment. He's in chains. He's under persecution. He knows his life is on the line. He knows he's probably eventually going to be martyred. And he's got people within the body of Christ who are exploiting his position for their own advantage. People can do things to hurt us so badly. People can do things to kick us when we're down that can shipwreck our faith and really hurt us. And sometimes it's by not the world, but our own brothers and sisters. We call it taking a hosen from the chosen. It's okay, you can laugh. I get, they were supposed to be this, or they're supposed to be, or that was my pastor, or that was my leader, and then they, they kicked me when I was down. They turned their back on me when I was in need, and I'm shattered, and I'm hurt, and I feel so broken and alone. Paul shows us two ways to survive the bad behavior of others in verses 19 and 20, and I close with this. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame, if anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Wow. Again, Paul's ego way down, his humility way up, his humble, uh, his humble desire. God, don't let me be an embarrassment to you by allowing people to embarrass me for the gospel's sake. God, don't let me falter. Let me be a good witness. Let me be a good example. Let me be a light shining 
in the darkness. Such a powerful uh, conclusion there. Whether by life or by death, I just want to glorify you, God. You know, most of us want our own way. God, if, if it goes my way, if, it, if, if I have life and prosperity and blessing, then I'll glorify you. But Paul says, by life or by death, whether I live or I die, I, I just want to please you and glorify you. Within that statement are two keys of how we survive the bad behavior of others. Number one, trust in the faithfulness of God to work out the details of your life. Trust in the faithfulness of God. Well, people are against me. People are plotting against me. People are not for me. It doesn't matter. If God is for you, who can be against you? Amen? <laughs> Nobody can stop the blessing of God from touching your life. No one can stop the purpose of God from touching your life. No one can stop the gifts of God from exploding in your life. No one can stop the blessing of God from pouring over your life. No one can stop it. Not man, not a relative, not a boss, not a devil or a demon in hell can stop the blessing of God from touching your life. Hallelujah. So why do we worry about what everybody else is doing? Oh, they're out to get me. God's not worried. He's going to accomplish his purpose in you. Number two, learn to manage your expectations. Listen to verse 20. According to my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. See, Paul talks about eager expectations and hopes. And we all have expectations. How many are, you know, humble enough to, to, to just admit in church, I have expectations for my life. I have hopes for my life. Anybody have dreams? Yeah, okay, praise God. Four and a half of you, praise God. The Graziosos are all excited over there, praise God. Thank you, Graziosos. But we all have hopes, we all have dreams. We all, you know, we don't just get up in the morning, I, I hope I come to a miserable end today. You know, we, 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 we have expectations. But expectations have to be managed because you know what, our expectations get out of control real quick. And they, they become driven by the flesh. And they become greedy. And then all of a sudden, we have unbiblical expectations. Well, God, I should never be hurting, or I should never have injustice touch my life, or I should never be sick. I should always be healthy. I should always have plenty of this and plenty of that and prosperity. And then all of a sudden, our expectations are unrealistic, and they set us up for disappointment and disillusionment. So we've got to manage our expectations. Learn not to expect too much from life and too much from people. Life will let you down. Pastor Mike, life can be disappointing. People will let you down. People will disappoint you. So why do we put so much stock in those things? We have to manage our expectations and trust 110% in God to have his way in our lives putting all our hope in Jesus and expecting him to be faithful, whether by life or by death. If I live, I live for Christ. If I die, I go to be with Christ. It's, it's, it's not an issue whether I live or I die. It's all for Christ, and this is what Paul said. Paul said, it's better if I stay here for you guys because you need me. You know, some of you are not too smart, and you know you need the gospel, and you need a lot of shepherding. It's better for me to stay, but if I had my choice... Oh, I want to be with Jesus. Amen? And that's the attitude we should have. Some of us are clinging on to life too hard. Amen? There's nobody in heaven go, I want to go back down. I want to, I want to, I want to, pay, I, I want to pay taxes and get up early. And I want to, no. You say, well, how do you know? I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just knowing that the wonders of what God has prepared for us are going to be so much better than anything this world has to offer. Amen. So we manage our expectations and we trust in the Lord. And, and, and in doing that, we, we don't allow people to hurt us or shipwreck our faith. Now, in just a moment, our dance team is going to come and they're going to minister to us this morning. And they're going to drive home the point of this message. 
Paul was in chains. He was suffering. He was being unjustly persecuted. And that will create a huge amount of stress in anyone. On top of all this, he had people like wolves drooling over his position and excited about the fact that he'd soon be out of the picture. So it would be very possible for Paul to feel very discouraged and feel very alone in this situation. Somehow, instead of that, he had joy. Maybe you're in deep waters today and you're scared. Maybe you're going through a fiery trial and you're overwhelmed. Maybe you're stuck in the valley of decision and you're paralyzed with fear and you don't know which way to go. Maybe you're overwhelmed or you're disappointed and there's darkness all around you. I want to remind you today, God is with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. He will complete the good work he started in you and he will come to get you at the end to take you to be where he is because he's been preparing a place for you. So you are not alone today. I want, as Kelly comes, I want you to enjoy this dance and I want it to minister to you today. So we'll